right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cafe Sci with Carnegie Science Center. I am Brad Peroni, and we're going to get started in a few moments. We're going to give uh, a few minutes for folks to log in. So if you're joining us and you're one of the early birds, I see uh, already about 16 people have joined us. Uh, Feel free to top up your beverages, grab a little snack, uh, you know, wrangle your significant other or a friend uh, to, to watch along. And we are going to get started with our presentation of Dare to Solar Cook, the physics of cooking with sunshine, just a couple minutes after seven o'clock. Welcome to everybody rolling in here. Rolling through the names, I see some familiar ones here. Welcome back to our regular attendees. Uh, I think I see some uh, names that might be relations of some of our panelists. So watch out, you know, if anything <laughs> uh, uh -oh. goes wrong with the Zoom, you might hear about it at the next family get together <laughs> next year. It's great to see so many people logging in already. We have a really interesting topic for Cafe Sci this evening. We're going to give it just a couple of moments to uh, allow for everyone to log in. For those of you who are already here, uh, you might find the Q&A box. You can type your questions in for our speakers at any time during the presentation and we'll be able to address those at the end. Uh, so there's no chat to talk with the other uh, audience members here, but anything that you type in there, uh, the panelists and I will be able to see and address. So if you have a question for a specific panelist tonight, uh, feel free to put their name in the question so that we can direct that to the right person when it comes time for the Q&A. All right, oh, and I see someone's already used that. Megan, thank you very much uh, for welcoming us. It's good to know that you're on board with us here. So while we're giving folks a moment to log in, I still see those uh, audience members trickling in here. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, PPG and Cook Myosite for their uh, continued support of Cafe Sci. We're very thankful for that to help this free program keep chugging along, especially uh, when we're beaming this directly into your homes. It's fantastic to know that we have that support in our community. I would also like to take a moment to thank anyone who took a moment to uh, make a donation when they registered for the event here. We really do appreciate the fact that you might uh, share with us some uh, donations to help keep this program going. It is a free program and we want to make sure it's available for as wide an audience as possible. So anyone who does make a donation uh, you really do help us with our mission for this program. So a very big heartfelt thanks to all of you who made a donation. If you're here for the first time tonight and you like what you see, this is a regular program that we do uh, mostly on the first Monday of the month. We might have some conflicts here and there with holidays. But if you decide you'd like to come back and check out the next speaker, you can find all of that information on our website, CarnegieScienceCenter.org. And if you feel so compelled to uh, support Cafe Sci with a donation, uh, we can suggest that you know, whatever you might spend going out to the movies with, uh, with a special someone might be a, you know, a good level to support this program. If you're not able to though, there's no pressure to do that. All right, it looks like our attendee count has started to level out. So we're going to uh, 
go ahead and start with our introductions for this evening. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Brad Peroni with Carnegie Science Center, and I will be our Cafe Sci host for this evening. And I would like to introduce our three guests. Uh, usually we have one speaker, but tonight we are lucky enough to have a trio of experts on solar cooking. Uh, we would like to introduce to you Mary Buschenek uh, and Jennifer Gasser, uh, our co-founders of the Solar Education Project, a subsidiary of the nonprofit Global Development Solutions. Solar Education Project is founded on the belief that solar cooking education can transform lives. Solar Education Project crafts diverse programs and workshops that have been shared nationally and internationally, including at numerous Carnegie Science Center STEM events. So thank you for being here again tonight to speak with this audience. Uh, Mary uh, has a 30-year career in education, and during that time, she incorporated solar cooking into her science curriculum as a multidisciplinary project-based unit that was a favorite of her students. And Jennifer's longtime commitment to education, combined with her love of travel, made uh, the Solar Education Project the perfect match. Sharing food and culture through solar cooking enhances her opportunity to connect with people. And we also have Alan Bigelow, PhD, joining us tonight. Uh, Alan joined Solar Cookers International in 2016 as Science Director and main representative of SCI to the United Nations. He leads uh, testing and performance evaluation programs at SCI and advocates for solar thermal cooking at the UN. So a wonderfully distinguished panel of guests. I am going to uh, turn everything over to these wonderful people. And Mary, I do believe we are uh, sending you first from this talented group. So go ahead and take it away. All right, let me. Okay, are we ready? We are ready and. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. We're really we're very excited to be here to talk to you about solar cooking. Um, and we want to thank Carnegie Science Center also for the invitation and this really, really great opportunity. Okay, Brad, I cannot advance my screen. All right, we'll uh, <laughs> and I go can't... ahead and and try uh, re relaunching PowerPoint and see if that uh, okay. works for you here. I'm not escaping. Okay, stop sharing. I'm so sorry. That's quite all right. Uh, with our second online Cafe Sci, uh, we are running into our first little technical hiccup. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'm first. I'm first at something, yay. You know what? We've got to find <laughs> the first bug to, to squash, so that's okay. I'm, we're honored. Okay. That <laughs> Let's try this. Okay. All righty, here we go. Yay. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, Jennifer and I founded um, Solar Education Project, uh, or SCP for short, um, in 2016. And we're based in the Youngstown, Ohio area, which is not far from Pittsburgh and Carnegie Science Center. And um, as Brad mentioned, for the past several years, we've had the privilege of participating in numerous STEM education programs um, at Carnegie Science Center. And you know, we believe uh, wholeheartedly that these programs are, are critical in their impact. They serve over 90,000 students of all ages each year. Carnegie Science Center has a tremendous commitment to STEM education outreach. And I just wanna say that we're so happy to just be a small part of that. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, tonight's webinar is gonna be recorded and it will be available online. So with the increase in, increase in virtual education opportunities, 
we see this as a valuable resource and we're hoping that you will share this with others. So let's get started with a quick introduction for any of you who might be unfamiliar with this technology. To be more specific, this is solar thermal cooking uh, because we're using devices that simply convert sunlight to heat energy, which is then transferred to the food for cooking. And pictured here are a few of the solar appliances that we use on a regular basis. In the upper left-hand corner is an evacuated tube. Underneath that is a parabolic burner. In the center, I have two examples of panel ovens. And on the right side, I have two examples of box ovens. And I just want to note that um, two of these are homemade cookers. So you can purchase a cooker or you can make a cooker. So to help people understand how these ovens work, SEP created the acronym DARE, which is part of our title of our, our presentation. Um, DARE lays out in sequence the basic principles of solar cooking based on how light interacts with matter. So let's take a look at each letter. Um, the D in DARE is direct. In solar cooking, sunlight is your fuel. So basically, when you want to cook, you have to gather fuel. And so the question is, how do you gather sunlight? Uh, well, you do this by using reflective material positioned in such a way that it directs um, extra sunlight into your cooking space. And in the diagram on the left, you see a box oven uh, demonstrating that concept. And on the right side is a um, representation of a parabolic oven, uh, also demonstrating how the light is directed to, toward the cooking space. The A in DARE is absorb. Uh, we know that black absorbs all the wavelengths of visible light. And then as that light is absorbed, it's transformed to heat energy. So in solar cooking, um, the cooking pots are black. And if you're using a box oven, uh, they'll have one or more uh, black surfaces on the interior. The R in DARE is retain. So you've got your heat inside your cooking space, and then the trick is to keep it there. Um, and you can do this in a number of, of ways, depending on what kind of oven you're using. If you're working with a box oven, it has to have sufficient insulation. And the lid has to be, like all the, the, the sides have to be uh, snugly fit to one another so that none of the heat escapes. Um, if you're using a panel oven, you're actually creating the cooking space uh, by surrounding the black cookware with a transparent heat trap. And I just showed some examples of uh, heat traps that can be used. You've got uh, reusable oven bags, uh, polycarbonate, uh, kind of a sleeve around the base of the pot, and then Pyrex glass bowls. And then the E, of course, is eat. And I'm excited to share these photos with you. Um, eating is what cooking is all about, regardless of what you, method you're using. And so the food aspect um, is extremely important. And I think it's critical for us in the solar cooking community to show people that you're not limited in what types of foods you can prepare with solar cooking appliances. Jennifer and I, and I know Alan also, um, we really challenge ourselves to cook a variety of foods using our different solar cookers. All the photographs are foods that Jennifer and I have prepared using the, the four different types of, of ovens. Uh, when we're doing a cooking workshop, the participants have the advantage of um, taking part in some or uh, sometimes all of the process of solar cooking from food prep to you know eating the food when it's prepared so it's a it's a very sensory experience including you know smelling and tasting uh, but because we're virtual tonight we wanted to share these photos with you um, and I also have a few short videos that I'd like to share with you. And I hope the quality is good enough for you to see the food cooking in the ovens. This is the box oven. And I prepared uh, chicken breast and stuffing. 
and you can see the steam rising. It was a quite a full pot. Um, I think we ate for two or three days out of that. Um, the next one, uh, these are panel ovens called Copenhagen's and these are both homemade. I use them frequently. And the one on the right is made with upcycled materials. If you look inside snack bags, sometimes the interior is very reflective. And if you open those up and wash them out, you can easily use those to cover um, a panel with to, to solar cook. This is an evacuated tube and I love to cook bread in the evacuated tube because it has a wonderful hard crusted texture. And then last is the parabolic burner. And you can see that it mimics the, like a, a burner on the top of a traditional stove. You can boil and fry with this type of oven. So when you see what these ovens are capable of and think about the fact that this is free fuel and zero emissions for, for the cooking process, it begs the question, what's the potential benefit you know, of solar cooking for people. And so for us, the answer to that is really simple. There's absolutely no benefit whatsoever unless people learn about it. So it's that simple reality um, combined with the relevance of solar cooking to STEM education that motivates us to share solar cooking as a learning tool. Here's one example of how solar cookers can be utilized as tools for education. This is SEP's Solar Express suitcase curriculum. And using this resource, students not only learn about solar cooking, but they understand it through STEM applications and multidisciplinary content and a series of hands-on activities and experiments called DARE tasks. So um, as Brad mentioned, I like to use project-based learning a lot when I was teaching and within this model of learning, students are really encouraged to become scientists and, you know, engineers, uh, mathematicians, and uh, designers. Uh, these are pictures of, of some of my students during one of our, our solar projects. And I encourage them to explore the impact of solar cooking in a real world context. And the cooker itself becomes a tool for educating students in areas of math, solar energy, sustainability, um, engineering, and a whole range of other disciplines, including uh, the arts. This kind of three-dimensional learning is relevant for students everywhere, um, even in a virtual setting, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. So with this in mind, one of the first solar cooking STEM manuals we created was for a trip we took to Haiti in 2016. If you can't read this, it's because it's in Haitian Creole. Uh, we wrote the manual, translated it, gathered together some hands-on materials, and then we shared it all with our host school in Port-au-Prince. Um, I wanna finish my portion of the program tonight by featuring a solar cooking STEM education project being conducted by our, our colleague, Kamali, who lives in Eldoret, Kenya. Kamali runs a nonprofit called Students Solar Cooking Science Projects that he and mentor Sharon Cousins started in 2011. Uh, we've had, SEP's had a, a very close uh, collaboration with Kamali for several years now. Kamali's personally instructed close to a thousand children and adults over the past decade and in his workshop, students learn about the science of solar cooking, a little bit of economics, and he also talks to them about the positive environmental and health impacts of uh, zero emission cooking. Students are totally engaged in the process, building and cooking with their ovens, and I think it's this engagement that is one of the best aspects of his program. Kamali specializes in the construction of box ovens and even shares his carpentry skills with the students, again, allowing them to take part in the process. This commitment to education and the use of solar cookers as tools for STEM learning is really at the core of 
uh, what Solar Education Project does. And whether it's the United States or Haiti or Kenya or any other place in the world, we believe that education and solar cooking are both transformational. Um, and with that, I thank you and I'll turn the program over to Dr. Alan Bigelow, who will share his unique experiences and a physicist's perspective on solar cooking. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mary. That was a wonderful presentation. And I have to say that I agree with you fully that education can truly benefit from solar cooking and solar cooking can benefit from education, hand in hand. And yes, I am a physicist and I'm also a solar cook like Mary and Jennifer. We like to use the solar cookers as often as we can. Meeting on sunny days when the sun is shining, we're cooking food. <laughs> now, I am the science director at Solar Cookers International, and I would like to let you know what we do at Solar Cookers International. And I will be focusing mainly on the three parts of our strategic plan, which is advocacy, research, and capacity building. But before I get there, I wanted to share with you all a bit about my personal journey to solar cooking. It, it started in, there we go, in San Diego at a conference by the American Solar Energy Society in 2008. And what you're seeing in this picture is a young one-year-old solar-powered eco-rock band, which I co-founded. I'm there in the red shirt. We were invited to play at this conference. And we were using solar photovoltaics, so the electricity part of, of solar energy to perform songs that had sun themes to them. And basically we were taking the climate issues and looking at for climate solutions and transmitting that through music. But little did we know at the time we were going to be adjacent to or set up right next to a very large display of solar cookers. So just behind us as we were performing was a display by the San Diego Solar Cooking Club. And I just was fascinated by this technology that was new to me at the time. And as a physicist, I looked at these devices and I thought, mm -hmm, those can work. Those can direct sunlight, absorb, retain in order to cook food. And another perspective that I had on these appliances was that these could be so helpful to many people around our planet who are still cooking using open fire today. And this is a big challenge for many people across the planet that just do not have readily available access to fuel for cooking. And that's unfortunate. However, there is this solution in areas where there are sunny days and where there can be materials uh, available for building solar cookers. And so I got very excited about this, this technology and we started demonstrating solar cookers regularly and sharing this um, with as many people as we could. Fast forward a few years to 2013 an incredible opportunity to join a solar trek. And this was the first of its kind where for nine days at high altitude, this team of trekkers had all of its food prepared using portable solar cookers. 
we were blessed by wonderful weather, as you can see in this picture. And along the way, when I say portable, here is a picture of the three large cookers that we brought along. And these were taken from one camp to the next during nine days. And you can see that these are all parabolic cookers. They would cook food for using right on site, but at the same time, in this picture, you can see a gentleman loading a cook pot into a very large basket. And this is a retained heat basket, which is also part of the whole solar cooking, integrative cooking uh, mode in that you have the solar cookers to heat food, bring them to cooking temperatures, but once they're at those cooking temperatures, they can continue cooking when they're placed into a retained heat basket. This trek is shown here on a map where we, uh, during nine days, made our way up to lake, a uh, sacred lake called Barib Kunt, and then, and then back to, uh, to, to our base at um, Duguna Fort. And along the way, uh, it was somewhat of a cultural experience as well, very much cultural. And um, I'll start with the food. <laughs> Here's a picture of one of our solar lunches. And um, the food that we had along this trek was a mixture of Nepali food and Western food. And it worked very well. We had solar cooked um, meals throughout. And even in the evening when it was very cold outside because we're at high altitude and it's dark, um, hot meals came out of the retained heat baskets. This was very interesting for the local people along the way. Uh, here is a woman who was fascinated with what we were doing and very curious, what are these large shining, shiny objects? <laughs> so we offered her a cup of solar tea and uh, she then probably went on to tell her her family and, and uh, neighbors about this. So uh, on we went. And here was uh, the moment where we had a fascinating time at a Tibetan Buddhist nunnery. And this is on our way up to the sacred lake that is sacred to both Tibetan Buddhists and to Hindus um, of the region. And finally, we returned to Duguna Fort that is pictured at the, at the end of that, um, that hill. And um, just a note, unfortunately, uh, about a year and a half after this trek happened, um, a large earthquake struck the region um, and really devastated the area. However, it's building back and people of that area have seen what solar cookers can do. And so there's, there's some traction for solar cooking in that specific area because of the Vajra Foundation, which uh, organized that particular trek. After the trek was over, we visited the Vajra Academy, which was uh, built by the Vajra Foundation. And I just wanted to show this to you all because I find this is a good example of how one can truly scale solar cooking to a high level for institutions. So this is a boarding school and on the roof of that school building, you can see a number of large dishes of concent concentrating dishes and students at this Vajra Academy are trained how to use this system. And this is a picture from the rooftop where this particular student has just reset the system for the day. And what this does is these large concentrating dishes will focus sunlight at receivers where water passing through the receivers is heated up to steam. And then the steam goes through plumbing pipes <laughs> down into what might look like a conventional kitchen of sorts um, where a lot of food can be cooked for the several hundred students who um, are attending and boarding at this school. So here you see pictures of the indoors kitchen um, and the assembly line for momos, which are delicious Nepali dumplings. And this is all made by solar steam um, system that was on the rooftop. Okay, now I'd like to walk through a number of the facets and 
aspects of solar cooking that really make up the appliance that allows solar cooking to work. So there are a number of ingredients there too. And we start with the sunshine. We do need to have sun to make solar cooking work. And it is an integrative solution, meaning that it fits in with other solutions that you might have already for cooking. But on sunny days, it's a wonderful idea to use the sun as your fuel source. This is an irradiation map showing, showing the global horizontal irradiation across our planet. And it is a heat map in that the more red the regions are, that is the more sun exposure those regions have on average throughout the year. So yes, there are certain areas of our planet that receive more sun on average per year, though on sunny days anywhere on the planet, you can solar cook. I happen to be in the New York City area, and on sunny days here, we do a lot of solar cooking. <laughs> okay, so after the sun, we then need to direct it, as Mary introduced with DARE, and with optics, um, we talk about ray tracing primarily as a way to bring the light from an object or the source to an image point, which in our case is where our food is being cooked. Okay, so two ways to make that work are shown here through either a lens or a curved mirror, a concentrating mirror. And ray tracing is basic physics approach to finding where is the image point for a, an optic, uh, an optical element. And you can see in both of these cases that there are three rays that can be drawn from the object that go and interact with the optic and then create a focal point at uh, the image. Um, they have a focus at the image. Now, in our system where the sun is so far away, those incoming rays are essentially all parallel. So um, and I'm going to quickly move on from this, this page to change the uh, incoming rays. And there are, they are parallel light rays because the sun is very far compared to the distances that we're working with. And here you can see how a converging lens can create uh, its, its focus. And uh, similarly, for a parabolic shape, and this is shown in two dimensions, you can see that parallel light rays coming in from the top of the image are reflected off the surface and concentrate and come together at one point. And one very basic fundamental aspect of reflectors is that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Okay? And that applied to a parabolic shape will have parallel lights, light rays um, brought together at the focal point of that. Now, if we rotate this two-dimensional version into something that's three-dimensional, which is our world in which we live, you can have something that looks like this, which is a very pure parabolic reflector used for cooking. It's a drawing, but it is a schematic drawing of a, of a powerful solar cooker. Now, mirrors come in different shapes, different sizes, different materials, and Mary mentioned some of them that are common to solar cooking. Some of my background from my school days uh, involves working with lasers. So there are very high-end reflectors that one could choose for very specific applications. And by going into the optics catalogs, one could choose ideal reflectors um, that have specific coatings on them and they're good for certain wavelength bands maybe for purple or blue or green. <laughs> and you can have a highly functioning system that is tuned for your application. Now, that is great if you are working in laser research and you really need to optimize all of your light management. However, keep in mind, 
those optics are quite costly. I'll return to that later, but I do want to point out that there are resources out there, um, many, many online that you can check for the, the specifications of the materials that you might want to work with or to help you choose if you are designing a solar cooker, what sort of reflective material to use. Now coming back to lenses, if you are using a lens to concentrate light for a solar cooker, it can be a very bulky device because you most likely want to capture a large amount of incoming light. So a lens would be very bulky, very expensive, very heavy, and uh, there is an approach to getting beyond that by essentially flattening the lens. So if you go from the top version of this curved lens and come down to the, the lower version, that's what we call a Fresnel lens. So that's a cross section of a Fresnel lens, which essentially retains the shape of the concentrating lens that you see above, but it uses a lot less material. These are quite simple to make. In fact, you can often buy them at um, stationary stores, places like, uh, well, I, I can stop with that, <laughs> but I'll show you uh, a, a simple one here that, that we have, have used for demonstrations in the past. But this is a, an example of a Fresnel lens that you might be able to purchase at, at a stationary store. And this, when you make them larger, truly can become a powerful aspect of a solar cooker. So I wanted to introduce some ray tracing to a Fresnel-based solar cooker. Um, and I'm gonna do this in two versions. So first, if you look at the one on the left, this is a Fresnel lens-based system. And I'll first apply some red lines across the optical uh, elements there. And so parallel light coming into the Fresnel lens will then start to concentrate from there on down to a mirror and reflecting off the mirror, light comes back up to a cooking surface and Sedi, who is here, is able to have uh, her food cook. In the version on the right, this is actually a Fresnel mirror. It's an example of a Fresnel mirror being used to, to, for, for a solar cooker. And again, the Fresnel approach is to take something that might be large and curved and quite bulky and essentially making a two-dimensional version of that that is lower cost and um, it's lighter weight and, and uh, less prone to damage perhaps. <laughs> So in the Fresnel mirror version that you see here, there is a large rack of, of two-dimensional mirrors. And I'll draw some red lines on there to where the incident light will go. So here are parallel beam rays of light coming in from the sun. And the array of mirrors there that you see are each hit, uh, positioned and tuned just so, so that they set up a concentrating effect. And then there's a secondary mirror at which the light bounces off of that, reflects off of that to the cooking surface. And this gentleman is Lauren Symington, and he's able to cook food for people who are passing by. That happened to be on a frostbite warning day on Staten Island. And it was a sunny day. So you can cook on sunny days, even during the winter time. Now, a question that some people might have is, do you really need to have a focusing system or can you get by with something that approximates a focusing system, but it's truly non-focusing actually. So I just wanted to show this as an example when you think of that as focusing versus non-focusing. This is a parabolic reflector and it happens to be constructed with a number of strips of material that are elongated triangles and then each of those flat triangles is set up on a curvature that is parabolic in nature. And then you have a rotation of those about the axis of that paraboloid. Now, that works very well, actually, for solar cooking. And I'll bring in the, the ray tracing for, for this one to, to show this. And what this does by not being a pure 
focusing system is that it actually distributes the spot size of the sun, meaning the image of the sun is enlarged a little bit. And we're working with cookware. That is our target. So we want to image the sun on a cooking pot. And the cooking pot is quite large compared to the size of an ideally focused um, uh, version, uh, image of the sun. So by using some non-focusing techniques or, or doing as well as you can with, with, uh, with what you have to work with, you can still create a, a very effective solar cooker. That cooker happens to be 1.4 meters in diameter and it's called the SK-14. Now, the next part of what Mary introduced you to with DARE is A, in absorbing light. I wanted to elaborate this just a little bit more. We want to absorb light on oven walls and also on cookware. And going back to my days as a laser physicist, we often needed to measure the power of our lasers. And we would measure the power at various points along the laser beam path using a power meter that had very much like the one shown here that has a matte black surface. And indeed, matte black, very dull black, is an excellent absorber. For cookware, shown here, it is quite common to use chalkboard paint. So what you might see on a blackboard, if that is initially plywood that is then um, painted with blackboard paint, which you can buy in many hardware stores around the world, this happens to be from an, an event in India, uh, just north of Mumbai. And this gentleman was painting this pressure cooker with matte black paint so that it could be used more effectively for solar cooking because it would absorb the sunlight more effectively on that coated surface. People have gone and done extensive research on this. Here is an abstract from a paper that was published last year. And this was looking at soot-based coatings for solar cookers. I had mentioned earlier that many people on our planet, about 40%, are still cooking over open fire on a regular basis. So they're using firewood or charcoal, and that can be very difficult and challenging for people to find and access, particularly in areas where there, are, there is extreme poverty and, and just not much access, uh, deforested regions. And in many of these regions, women and girls are often walking for long distances to scavenge for wood. It's a dangerous activity. And in areas um, where that is happening, sometimes in the peripheries of refugee camps, there's tension with the local populations that can truly lead to, to uh, I'll keep it simple here because I know that we have a mixture of our audience, but it can lead to tensions and conflict. And so folks who are using fire and, and cooking over that, uh, the cookware can often get coated with soot. And soot actually happens to be an excellent absorber of, of light. So this particular paper will go into that in depth. If you're interested to read it, please do. And, um, you can use this sort of information that is readily available online these days for helping design your solar cooker. The next letter of Mary's acronym, I should say Mary and Jennifer, uh, in DARE is R for retaining heat. And we actually are retaining heat on our planet every day. And you may be very familiar with this already, but I have to go through the greenhouse effect. And here, this schematic shows that solar radiation from our sun will get through our atmosphere. Some is scattered, and sunlight that is absorbed on the planet will warm the planet. And as the planet warms, the planet also gives off heat-based light, which is often, we would call it infrared light. Some of that sun, uh, infrared light will escape our atmosphere, but uh, uh, some of it is trapped. And it will warm the atmosphere and also keep our planet warm 
as if it were a blanket over our planet. And we depend on this. Life depends on this to function and to regulate the temperature. So if we can maintain a good greenhouse layer, all will be well. However, we are living in a way that is emitting a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Shown here are many of the sources of greenhouse gases being emitted. And included on this, you'll even see forest burning. And yes, forest burning will, will emit CO2 and also black carbon or, or soot from, from uh, cooking fire. And soot can also accelerate some of the climate change that we are, are, are being affected by these days in terms of the microscopic soot particles landing on ice pack and snow can actually be um, leading to an accelerated rate of melting because these microscopic black particles are absorbing more sunlight than, might, than there might normally be reflected off of snow and ice pack and it's actually leading to an acceleration of that. Well, we're using up a, a lot of uh, fossil fuel in the way we live and the, the greenhouse gas emission is something that's measurable. And this chart is a measurement from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And this goes from the 1960s on up to, I just pulled this off last month uh, from their website. And we can see an annual cycle that goes up and down that happens to be seasonal for when trees have leaves and when the leaves fall. Uh, but that has continued to rise. And so we are seeing on this plot over time the x-axis is the year, but the y-axis is showing the parts per million of, in this case, CO2, carbon, di carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So this is leading to our greenhouse becoming too much, uh, being too effective, or overly effective. It's performing too good, so it's getting hot here. Now, for solar cooking, we may actually want that, so let's now jump on to solar cooking. I wanted to first show this slide that, that indicates how much of the sunlight actually arrives on our planet. And you can see here that the spectrum of light from the sun uh, can be categorized as ultraviolet on the short wavelength side, visible, which is the light that we're able to see, and then the infrared light. So uh, all of that is coming from the sun uh, in, in, as shown as in this spectrum. And the, that can be characterized by what we call a black body. An I'll, ideal black body that has this temperature will emit light with that spectrum, okay? Now, as this sunlight, which is uh, peaking at um, the yellow uh, band, passes through our atmosphere, some of that is absorbed by water vapor, CO2 oxygen bands that we have, uh, ozone as well, in our atmosphere. So what arrives on the planet's surface is the, what's shown in red here. Okay, now we're going to work with that. So coming back to some optics, uh, some materials that may be very good for greenhouses, let's consider Pyrex. So Pyrex, as a material, Shown here, this is the transmission spectrum for Pyrex. So this, this black line will allow light through, okay? And if I overlap visible light on Pyrex, one can see that visible light is, uh, well, Pyrex is transparent to visible light. That's great. We want the light to come in through our greenhouse layer. Now, our cookware will start to heat up and get warmer. So this plot here on the right is showing the black body spectrum. And for the sun, sunlight, uh, what's shown is 500, five, sorry, 5,777 Kelvin is emitted by the sun. And 300 Kelvin is down here. That's the spectrum that's emitted just from room temperature, more or less. But for 
oven temperatures of 500 Kelvin, which translates to 440 Fahrenheit or 227 Celsius, one can see that the infrared emitted from that hot surface is primarily in the infrared region beyond visible, but it can be shown by this curve here. And now let's try to transport that curve back to the other graph. So bear with me, here we go. What this is, is my attempt to show that infrared light given off a hot cooking vessel will not make it out of the Pyrex bowl. So the Pyrex bowl closes a door on infrared light and it will keep it in, but it's an open door to visible light. Visible light comes in and then the infrared light will stay inside. Uh, mostly. <laughs> okay, so that is showing Pyrex as a uh, greenhouse. There are also other modes for retaining heat, and um, Mary mentioned some earlier in terms of insulation, and there are many, op many materials that can be used for insulation. I would suggest that anyone designing a solar oven or solar cooker that needed insulation to be sure that it's food safe. Make sure that whatever you're using won't outgas and give off toxic uh, materials that could um, be harmful to you when you eat the food. Now, uh, so there, there's many natural fibers. Sea salt happens to be one that we've worked with, with, with some of our collaborators. Um, heat retention is also another wonderful uh, way to retain heat. And this gentleman, he was from our solar trek. He's carrying one of those heat retention uh, baskets. Now the thermal battery is, I would say, it is in a transition stage under development. So depending on how crude or how high tech you are wanting to be, uh, we have many crude uh, examples of thermal batteries today, even using rocks or bricks. These are materials that can hold a lot of heat and, and uh, it has the, the, this material has the capacity to, to hang on to that heat for a long time and you can use that later even after perhaps the, the, the clouds come or the sun goes down to continue cooking. Though there are research grade um, thermal batteries that are not yet on the market um, using uh, materials such as uh, phase change materials. And this is an exciting development that I look forward to seeing on the market someday. But I just wanted to mention that uh, retaining heat is, is a, a very important aspect of solar cooking. And I remember being told by a delegate at one of the United Nations climate conferences that once the thermal battery is available, uh, solar cooking is, is truly going to be everywhere. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but um, it, it, it is uh, it's something that a lot of people are interested in, in having. Okay, next I'd like to just go over a few design considerations about solar cookers. I, I've covered some of the more research grade aspects of the materials in, in solar cooking, but when it comes down to the, our real world and if someone's making a product that they want to sell. Let's look at these aspects. Affordability is, is, is it's essential. Many of the people who can most benefit from a solar cooker are living below the poverty level, making perhaps $2 a day. And I've heard that in some cases, families making that amount of income could spend close to half of their earnings on firewood and charcoal. So that's a reality. And the most vulnerable people who we would like to help with solar cooking um, cannot afford much. So while we can make a high tech space age solar cooker, maybe there's another way to take this approach so that it will actually reach the people that, that really need it. Availability. Um, local manufacturing with local materials by local artisans bring in the capacity for building solar cookers locally so that they don't have to be shipped. This will keep the costs down and also increase the capacity for solar cooking 
in regions of greatest need. Appearance, how does it look? Is it attractive? Does somebody want to use it for solar cooking? Now that and the next item here, function, how well will it work? These are two very important aspects where solar cooker designers should listen to the users. The women solar cooks who are out in villages and they're using something that is very different from how they've always been cooking. What do they think about it? Does it work for them? Do they want to use it? Are they able to use it? Then what suggestions might they have for you as a designer to improve it, to make it truly work as best as it can be for them? We call that inclusive design listen to the feedback of the users and incorporate their feedback into improving your solar cooker. Lastly, I wanted to just mention sustainability. Sustainability is something that we're very interested in these days for our planet, our own lives, our health, our environment. And while we have options and choices for what materials we would use to construct something, a designer can look at the carbon footprint of each material, what it takes to put it all together, and what it takes to get that to a customer. Now, this is something that consumers are looking into more and more these days. They're asking, how much energy did it take to make that thing? <laughs> so along with that, they're asking, what am I going to do when I'm done with it? Can I recycle it? Can I turn it into something else? So I'm just throwing these out as, as aspects to consider for people who are designing solar cookers. Now, I work at Solar Cookers International. So who is SCI? Who is Solar Cookers International? SCI is a nonprofit based in Sacramento, California, and it works to improve human and environmental health by supporting the expansion of clean and sustainable solar cooking in vulnerable regions. We work with hundreds of collaborators in over 135 countries to spread solar cooking. Why solar cooking? You've heard a number of these benefits already, but I, would want it, I just wanted to have them all listed so that you could take these in. It's truly spectacular to have zero fuel cost, zero air pollution, zero greenhouse gas emissions, zero inhalation of smoke, zero time or danger from collecting biomass fuel. It reduces deforestation. It can cook nutritious meals. They can be used for drying food. So this can be a great help to farmers to have value addition to their crops. It can be used for pasteurizing water to make it safe for drinking. I want to just follow up on that point of water pasteurization. We consider a complementary technology to solar cooking, the water pasteurization indicator, also known as the WAPI. And this device, which this woman is holding in her hand, it's at the end of a, a, of a string, it has green wax inside a transparent tube. And this wax melts at the pasteurization point of 65 degrees Celsius. So that wax acts as a thermometer, a binary thermometer. It's either yes or no. And by using this WAPI, one can know when their water has reached 65 degrees Celsius. And if you look at the microbes on the right side of this, you can see that they will all be killed rapidly at that temperature. So this can truly be a lifesaver for those who are there may be drinking water that has microbes in it that could be toxic to them, and harmful to them. Uh, SCI works on three items uh, in our strategic plan. We have capacity building, advocacy and research, and all of this comes together for a world of solar cooking. And I did want to share these pictures here, which come from a, one of our collaborative projects in northern Kenya at Kakuma refugee camp. And what you see here are all local foods that are cooked with this large box oven that is built locally 
using local materials by local people, people building them. And you have uh, stew, there are beans, rice. The greens is called sukuma wiki. It's a dish that people can make to help them get through the week. <laughs> it's actually the literal translation of, of sukuma wiki. And corn. Now, similar to education, as you're hearing from the Solar Education Project, SCI educates at a variety of levels, but we like to get our message across to those who are at the United Nations. SCI has held special consultative status at, at the Economic and Social Council, also known as ECOSOC at the United Nations, for uh, since the late 90s. And this is actually our access point to the United Nations where we can get access to events and we are able to interact with delegates and encourage solutions such as solar cooking that can be applied to the sustainable development goals, for instance. And these are the 17 sustainable development goals um, mentioned here with their icons. And solar cooking actually has a positive connection to all of these goals. You can look at them one at a time and wonder, no poverty? Well, if people can save money by using a solar cooker instead of having to buy expensive, for them, charcoal and wood, that certainly is helping their, their financial situation. Approaching hunger, health, education, gender equality, water, energy, etc. SCI has put together one of, as one of our advocacy materials this, this sheet that actually discusses how and specifically states how solar cooking can benefit each of those 17 sustainable development goals. The last goal on that list is for partnerships and that's truly important for not only so the, the solar cooking sector to spread solar cooking worldwide, but it's also essential for the United Nations to get work done. So the United Nations actually invites nonprofit members and, and civil society organizations to be a part of the deliberations at the United Nations. So this is one way that we work on advocacy. Another advocacy material that I'd just like to share here is SCI's response to COVID-19, a truly global pandemic that we are all experiencing now. And solar cooking can help. And we've spelled that out here. This happens to be a copy of our summer newsletter. And this is available on our website as is the previous slide I showed. So please come and visit us at www.solarcookers.org. But in short, if you are able to use the energy, the clean, sustainable energy that is delivered for free to your door, <laughs> sunlight, uh, for cooking, this can minimize the time that you might spend at a fuel market, mingling with other people where diseases might spread, communicative diseases might spread. Also, by having less smoke, uh, breathing less smoke because you're solar cooking, uh, it is shown in, in the literature, in the scientific literature, that that would reduce your pre-existing conditions and you can fend off viruses uh, more readily. So solar cooking has a, an excellent role in helping curb uh, the spread of COVID-19. So I wanted to now shift to our research stage, and this is a picture from SCI's Fifth World Conference in Sacramento, California, at a time when several gaps in the solar cooking sector were brought up. And one of those gaps was, what do we do about claims from manufacturers that their solar cooker is the best in the world? And this led to a lot of confusion among consumers. And it turned out that when SCI heard that this was, there was a need to have an internationally agreed upon testing mode for, for solar cookers. We started working on that. And as a nonprofit, as a brand agnostic organization that does not favor one brand over another, SCI started developing a testing platform. 
There are many ways to test a solar cooker. There are several excellent protocols that have been published. And we were given some advice to harmonize with what was going on at the International Organization for Standardizations. And this was very well timed, I would say, for this need of a testing protocol. And indeed, the group that you see pictured in, in, in these two pictures, one from Nepal in 2017 and one from the recent gathering in Kenya, has now published the standards for measure, measuring performance, measuring durability, measuring safety for a variety of clean cooking solutions, including solar cookers. So what we have done at SCI is we have developed instrumentation that automates the protocol for measuring the performance of a solar cooker. We call this our performance evaluation process. And this was uh, really pushed forward by our research specialist, J Justin Tabachnik, who constructed the instrumentation. And that is shown here. It's a, a, a small weather station and it has an anemometer on the top to measure wind speed. We, we wanna make sure we're not testing in high wind conditions. And we are recording the incident sunlight with a pyranometer. And then we have thermal couples to measure the temperature of water inside the cooker. That's a standard medium for heating. And we're also keeping track of the ambient air temperature to compare the two. So Justin has now built several of these stations and we at SCI have equipped and trained four locations, uh, two of our own, but also one in Nepal and one in Kenya, shown here. We have uh, now been testing and um, the solar cookers that you see here represent those that were committed for solar cooking, uh, for, for the performance evaluation process, PEV. And for some of these, the testing is complete. For some of these, the testing is, is ongoing. And uh, it's very exciting to see this now taking on so that we can have a numerical value to associate for each solar cooker that's tested for how well it performs in watts. So the, the figure of merit is a number in watts, which is the, 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 the standard unit for power. And how do we do this? These two plots can help show how, the, how we obtain our results. The plot on the left shows temperature of both water in, in this case, the Fornelia Mini, it's a evacuated tube cooker, and also the ambient air temperature. And over time, the temperature of the water will increase and we can measure the power over intervals of 10 minutes at a time. Um, and one will see that as that water starts heating, the slope uh, is pretty high, but then it starts to level off as you get up to higher temperatures. And what we do is we look at the power at a point where the temperature in the water is 50 degrees Celsius above the ambient temperature. So if the ambient air, air temperature is about 30, we would be looking at what is the power at about 80 degrees Celsius in the water. Meanwhile, we, we record the solar irradiance to use that as a normalization factor and also keep track of the wind speed. We record power. Um, uh, th this is taken at 10 minute intervals and uh, the protocol that we're following uh, requires 30 of these 10 minute observations over three days of testing. And in this case, we've put those on this graph and you can see that where the linear fit of those power points crosses a 50 degree Celsius line that defines our standard cooking power for that particular solar cooker. So in this case, 93 watts. So I should now uh, show you a series of these measurements and, and the, the results from several solar cookers that we have tested at SCI. And I just wanted to emphasize that this measure is a measure of the uptake of power into water as it heats. And it's important to keep that in mind. That's different from, say, if you have an electrical appliance 
and it has a rating of power, but that is really what is going in to that device from your outlet, your electrical outlet. So that's different from the actual power uptake into the medium, but this is very typical, I would say, values for solar cookers that we're seeing here. We're excited to share these, and these are also on our website, and we encourage people to uh, choose PEP-tested solar cookers and also for manufacturers to have their cooker tested by SCI using our PEP platform. SCI also offers resources for, um, for spreading the capacity, to increase the capacity of solar cooking. So you see them here. We have surveys that can be used for, for projects. We have best practices that we recommend um, in project development and data collection. And also we have a platform for networking. One of our very exciting uh, tools uh, that is available through the John Calvin Solar Cooking Toolkit happens to be uh, also found in the Solar Cooking Wiki, which is an exhaustive, comprehensive resource of solar cooking information. It's like an encyclopedia. It's interactive. You can add information to that but please visit it and use it often. It has its own uh, website, which is slightly different from ours. It's solarcooking.org. Okay. Um, also, we keep track of where are solar cookers around the world. This is a map. It's a global map of the solar cookers that we are aware of. So SCI listens to the field and those who are out in the world um, distributing solar cookers, spreading solar cookers, selling solar cookers, will report to us um, how many, when, and where, and we track progress on this map that you see here. So from that map and those numbers, we can generate impact data, such as what you see here, the number of solar cookers worldwide, 3.9 plus million, and um, how many people are directly impacted by that, 7.5 billion meals solar cooked and preventing an amount of CO2 emission into the atmosphere, 30 million tons, and a potential for savings if this is spread uh, more. <laughs> and so we have a potential of impact if, if solar cooking is scaled worldwide. And SCI has put together and published these solar cooking impact summaries, one for each country. These are available on our website, and this is part of our advocacy material to encourage countries to choose solar cooking, to, choose, to encourage countries to include solar cooking as a solution in their nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. And that's a part of how the countries are engaged with the Paris Agreement, okay, at the United Nations level. Also, we are encouraging countries to report that they are using solar cooking in their countries during their voluntary national reviews at the high-level political forum at the United Nations. I know that's a lot of UN jargon uh, just now, but it is important to bring the awareness level to the people that can truly make uh, change, the policymakers. So with that, I'd like to now encourage you all. This is uh, um, a call to action. Join the solar, the global solar cooking movement. And there are a number of ways that you can plug in. I've listed them here. So visit our website, www.solarcookers.org, sign up for our newsletters, etc., and use the wiki at solarcooking.org and um, get in touch with us. So with that, I now finally thank you all. We thank the SCI um, supporters. Um, the picture here includes Jennifer and Mary, who were uh, part of our advocacy team at the United Nations several times in, in New York. And uh, I also wanted to thank um, the, well, the, the, the Carnegie Science Center for this opportunity to share about solar cooking. As I pass the microphone, back to the Solar Education Project. Jennifer Gasser is going to talk more about the program, programmatic aspects. What else can you do with solar cookers beyond cooking? And finally, the woman shown here, this is Charity. Charity is a woman from South Sudan at a refugee camp, but now she can cook 
with clean, sustainable energy because she has a solar cooker, thanks to uh, some of the, the, the wonderful collaborators that we have who are working in the field. Okay, so thank you very much. And Jennifer, uh, you are next. Stop share. There we go. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alan. And I'm going to get through this in less than 10 minutes so we can get on with your questions. So this is a very important part, um, the collaborative projects in solar cooking education. And these are more uh, local projects and we are a part of them. We design educational programs for all ages in all regions of the world. SEP participated in over 100 programs spanning six countries and distributed or built 733 solar ovens along the way. We are proud to be a part of these programs and look for new and creative ways to introduce solar ovens. Our first program in Haiti was a medical dental mission and we trained the trainers. We worked with a dozen volunteers who shared solar cooking within, within the Chantel community. We started by training on the parabolic and where they cooked rice and bean and spaghetti with herring. And this panel oven, we made cake. Uh, we shared food and culture in a way that helped us learn about Haiti's rich history. Two years later, we broad broadened our focus to include teacher in service training. And we shared our prototype solar education suitcase right here and uh, it was a very interesting teacher and service training. To help the students gain computer and research skills, the Rotary Block Grant donated over a dozen computers and two servers. Denny developed Haiti Internet in a Box to create the intranet through Wi-Fi. And now Computer Lab was very usable at all times. SCP is very excited to announce that soon our solar cooking lesson plans and activities will be available along with SCI's manuals and soon will be added to 6,000 computers. Our program model is, is very simple. We consider local sources first. We base our programs on their needs. One such local resource for us is Youngstown State University where Dr. Sturis and Balaz mentor the Choose Ohio First Scholarship Program. This is Taylor. She is a YSU engineering student and research team member for over two years, and she is an important part of our SEP team. YSU selected the Copenhagen oven as their research project. A fastener system was problematic and difficult to assemble and the team redesigned a much simpler system and made the oven more stable and offered greater panel adjustability. The YSU prototypes will be used in Haiti for a one-year evaluation. And as soon as the research starts up, um, it is on hold, currently on hold right now. This is Denise. She sells her baked goods at the local market each week. She cooks with charcoal and recognizes the pro problematic health and environmental issues. And after a brief training with the Copenhagen oven, Denise performed her own experiment. She baked her own recipe with her own ingredients and gave it a taste test. Luckily, it was successful. She loved the taste and she took the oven home to continue baking every day the sun would shine. Joseph is a friend and restaurant owner in Sharon, Pennsylvania, and he has long dreamed to build an education center in his hometown of Pellerin, Haiti. The building is almost complete, and now he turns his focus to the outdoor kitchen. Joseph embraced solar cooking and wants to, induce, wants to introduce a large scale community oven and two permanently posted box ovens for his group to use. This program, the University of Notre Dame in Hench, Haiti, is a great example of large scale group collaboration. From start to finish, Rose involved experts from a variety of solar cooking realms, such as manufacturing, education, and advocacy, to partner with the university. 
The program is the first that we're aware of university level two credit elective course in solar cooking and biogas. The program is in its third year and has a bright future thanks to the funding from the Public Private Alliance Foundation. SCP collaborated on the UNDH curriculum framework and offered educational resources for the project. We were invited to guest lecture two classes where we presented a living business model canvas. One student from the class was interested in our programs and remained in contact with us over the next year. Meet Ellie. He was our interpreter for the entrepreneurship class and he is a senior biomed major with the UNDH program. Ellie is looking forward to graduation this year and yet he's not confident that there will be a job available for him. He's considering a startup and building his first box oven. Ellie promotes solar cooking in Haiti uh, to improve water pasteurization and environmental degradation. We connected Ellie to Camely, who will mentor him on the construction of his solar oven. Efforts on the local level eventually yield to a broader need to discuss global issues. SCP's involvement with SCI continues in attending the high level political forum as representatives to the United Nations and Mary's SCI global advisor. Advocacy efforts are improved when international conferences link timely information to global trends, important research and oven design developments within our unique sector. This is Dr. Taylor. He is one of the founding directors of Learning Streams International and Professor Emeritus of Hiram College. LSI is an experience, experiential learning science education collaborative dedicated to promoting student solutions to local environmental issues. At the close of each program, the students enjoy the annual Tea on the Green with solar baked desserts. SEP introduced an engineering design challenge for students to design, build, cook in their solar ovens. And we later added my favorite, the on time and on budget constraint to better simulate real world parameters. In 2017, SCP team leader and GDS founder, John Bushenik traveled to Pakistan to replicate the program as a part of LSI's continuing mission. Solar ovens featured prominently in the students' programs of the capstone projects, and we value our continued relationship with the Pakistani teachers. Millions of people are adjusting to the work from home lifestyle, and SCP is no different. We provide virtual programming and recently connected with groups in Mexico and Tanzania. They want educational support within their communities. And so it continues. We have come full circle tonight and to end the program by making an announcement of a unique solar oven lending program within our own community with the local Hubbard Public Library. Thank you, Cynthia, for your hard work and dedication and vision. Solar cooking offers a wide variety of educational and scientific opportunities. We invite you to give solar cooking a try. Thank you so much for your time and interest, and we look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much. Jennifer and Alan and Mary, that was uh, a, a wonderful suite of presentations here. And we've got several questions that have come in. Before we start taking those, I would like to remind everybody that there is a Q&A box. It should be down uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and type your questions in there. And if it's a question for a particular uh, panelist, feel free to go ahead and make a note of that in the question. Uh, so far, I've seen some questions come through about the science of solar cooking, some of the programmatic aspects of SEP's work, uh, and just some questions about the cooking itself. Uh, so I'll throw some of these questions out. This one came in uh, during Mary's presentation. Uh, can you tell us more about how SEP makes connections for worldwide education outreach? 
Um, sure, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, how do we make connections? Um, Jennifer and I always talk about the fact that the first thing you have to do is, is show up. Like you have to put yourself out there in situations where people know uh, what you do and what your passion is and make yourself available. Um, I know I, I featured Camille, um in my presentation and I actually met Camille through Solar Cookers International uh, at the 2014 International Conference. And uh, we were presenting together a poster presentation along with Sharon Cousins, who was his mentor at the time. Um, and then I guess uh, through, uh, you know, being able to communicate with people through the internet um, and social media, we've maintained those connections. So you just, you, you don't, you know, er, we kind of consider ourselves dot connectors sometimes, like you, you meet somebody and, you know, maybe a month later or two months later, you think, oh, that person would be perfect to meet, you know, another person that we've met. And so we, we try to always keep that in our minds that, um, that there are, you know, a lot of people out there wanting information and especially with the, the educational programs that we're offering. Um, so, so we just, we show up, we let people know what we do and, you know, that we're interested in, um, in sharing. And when we get requests, we, you know, we will do virtual presentations um, and just try to keep that, that two-way communication going. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any more um, to add to that. No, you covered it well. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. And I should note that question was from Sylvia. Uh, the next question is from Celestino and uh, this one is for Alan. Uh, could you please uh, talk about an approximate value of the fraction of diffuse solar irradiance being absorbed by a cooking pot when used on a parabolic cooker, a panel cooker, and a box cooker? Uh, and the question asker uh, wants to know this because they're using beam solar irradiance and others are using global irradiance <laughs> when testing solar cookers. Thank you, Celestino. <laughs> and I think if you yeah. should be able to uh, click the Q&A button there, uh, Alan, so that you can see that. It's a big, meaty question, so you should be able to pull that text of the question up. Okay. Well, my, gen my response to this is that Diffuse irradiation and uh, direct irradiation can be absorbed in the, in, in the same way it's still light, uh, though you will have a different spectrum from the scattered uh, component. So if your coating is particular to, uh, if it has tendency to favor parts of the spectrum, then there, there might be an adjustment there in, in uh, the fraction that's, that's picked up. It, as you know, this is a complicated uh, and dynamic situation in that, in that even during one day, the amount of direct light to a diffuse light will change. It, it changes uh, regularly all the time. So, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand exactly the, your question about the fraction um, being absorbed, but I, I would, I would say that it's it's very similar. Now, um, you were mentioning the uh, researchers are using beam solar irradiance and others using global irradiance when when testing solar cookers. Yeah, this this is something that will have um, differences depending on the design of the cooker, and um, as. There is a lot of discussion uh, about that, you know, a, a parabolic system versus a box oven. Um, you can see some differences. Um, but I would like to remind people about the size aspect, the spot size of the cookware uh, versus the spot size of a, of a focus point of sunlight. And it's it can be quite different. I was looking at some calculations earlier about 
the size of the sun spot from a, a quality lens or quality reflective mirror, it can be down on the order of millimeters to centimeter in a system that might be one that we would uh, we, we, we've come across fairly commonly with solar cookers. Now that's very small compared to the size of the cook pot generally. So the size of the cook pot being larger can accommodate the diffuse radiation coming in as well for uh, along with the direct the direct light. Um, I hope I'm I hope I'm answering your question on on that. Uh, but again, I think if you look closely at the at the materials that are being used, you you could look at uh, whether or not there would be um, a change between the the scattered light versus the direct light. Uh, but I think it, it's light is light and Generally, the coatings used on solar cookers, if you look at the paper I shared, um, the absorption is very high. Um, so, <laughs> okay, I think maybe we can move on and, and Celestino, I'll be happy to follow up with you later. Yeah, you know how to reach me. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we've got, uh, and Celestino thanks you as well, uh, in Portuguese, no less. I'll be good. Um, <laughs> So we have some general cooking questions here. So I guess anyone feel free to, uh, to jump in on some of these. Uh, the, uh, so there are a few that we can summarize uh, from Stephen and Michael. Uh, how do you control the temperature when you're cooking and how does the timing of the cooking compare to a more conventional oven or stove who wants to go me okay i'll start um how do you control the temperature um the sun kind of controls the temperature i'll we'll start there um and in some ways it's a it's um you really get tuned in to your to your sunlight to your available fuel source um also, depending on the type of oven that you're using, uh, you know what your range of temperatures will be. So, uh, for example, those um, panel ovens that I told you that I, I make myself and use, uh, they, they cook in a, in a very moderate range. So, uh, for me, they work similar to a crock pot. Uh, so, I can uh, put something in there and I know what types of foods to cook in there and um, and then I also observe my sun. If I have a, a really intense sun that's, that's overhead and very direct, I know that I'm gonna be working at a higher temperature. Um, and so I adjust for that. So it's, it's kind of an art also. Um, if people aren't comfortable with that, you can always insert thermometers into your oven so that you can see what temperature uh, you're working with. And you know, I had that question too when I started solar cooking and I was, researching, you know, uh, some of those things. And I discovered that even our conventional modern ovens are always working in a range uh, of temperature. So when we set it at say 325, it doesn't mean that the oven is always at 325. It will drop several degrees below and then it kicks on and it comes back up and it increases above 325 and then it comes back down and it it just continues that kind of a swing um, while in our minds we're thinking oh that oven is at 325 but it really isn't um, so um, i also wanted to mention there's a gentleman i can't think of his name right now who is uh, really involved with a tracking system and his tracking system is designed to um, it's connected to a, a, a thermometer, thermostat, uh, so that he can slightly adjust the oven to um, either have a little more sunlight, a little less sunlight, and he does that uh, also with a, a solar panel, um, and he's able to maintain a temperature. So I think he's, um, you know, he's, he's been really creative with trying to uh, to, to be able to say that his oven is cooking at a specific temperature. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add to that, um, Alan or Jennifer. I'll jump in, but Mary, that, that was great.
Great. Um, and to carry on with that, um, I want to bring in the factor of time. And that with solar cooking, as you learn to solar cook, you will become an expert with the time and temperature relationship. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that, as Mary said, it's often the, the sun that will do the majority of the, the temperature control for you. So a lot of this is regulated by available sun. If, if your solar cooker is not at the temperature where you want it to be, ideally, well, you can often compensate by cooking for a longer amount of time to allow for the same amount of energy to come in and do the job of cooking the food. On the other side of this, if your oven is too hot <laughs> and it's, it's a higher temperature than what you would expect, then you can go for a shorter amount of time. Um, I would also say that uh, there, there are other tricks that uh, some solar ovens come with, with uh, reflectors that, that can be put in place or, or taken away. Sometimes the manufacturer will call those boosters or uh, it's sold as an auxiliary item. And so that is one way to, to step up uh, the capacity for temperature for a particular oven. Um, and once you have the, the highest level of performance for a particular oven, you can diminish temper, uh, the, the temperature by sometimes using a mask or, or a, a, a material to put over the oven to block sunlight from coming in. Now, that said, I'd like to challenge researchers and students to, to come up with new ideas. I, I can envision that you could have a, a, an oven that is getting too hot, but maybe a thermal uh, regulator in there could open a vent and, and uh, get some of that heat to go out, bring in some cooler air, that sort of thing. Have a reservoir maybe next to it that has the hotter air that's been uh, stored with uh, maybe another uh, side to your oven that can shuttle in air easily. Now, a lot of this can be done with low cost uh, electronics, similar to what we use for our PEP instrumentation, which is all based on the Arduino platform. So those of you who are electronically uh, inclined, um, try it out, <laughs> contribute to this work. There, there are certainly, um, there's room for um, development and taking this to another level. Great. And uh, Alan, you also answered whether uh, intentionally or unintentionally, I think you answered Constance's question about uh, food that starts to cook at one temperature, but then the temperature has to change midway through. So uh, pumpkin pie comes to mind. Oh. Oh, yeah. can, I, can I say something about that? Um, hi, Constance. <laughs> um, there, are, uh, there are certain foods, you know, I look, when I'm, I'm determining what I'm going to cook, you depend on the weather a lot. And in Northeast Ohio, we're known for cloud cover, and I know Pittsburgh also. Um, so there are, there are times when, you know, I would love to be able to put something in particular out of my cooker, but I don't. I choose not to, uh, just because of my local conditions. Um, and so that would be one of them. I would not attempt to bake a pie that I have to start out at 425 degrees and then bring it down to 350 for the balance of, of the cooking time. But um, if you saw the pictures of the foods that we've cooked, there's just such a variety and they're delicious. I mean, there's, it's, it's a variety. And I still, after all these years of solar cooking, when I open that oven and the steam comes out and you smell the food, like I still get excited and I still like, wow, this is so cool and I sometimes can't believe that I just cooked something with sunlight. And this is after years of doing it. So it never loses its, its cool factor. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions here and uh, to anyone who might be on the fence about asking your question, there's plenty of time to get those questions in, uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, we have a question from Becky. What does the food cooked by solar cooking taste like compared to uh, traditional cooking methods? And that, I guess, could be for anybody. We are all solar cooks here. So, yeah. Um, I remember the first time I tried solar cooked food, which was which is food that I cooked. <laughs> and uh, when I got my first solar oven, I, 
I couldn't believe it. I thought this is amazing in that not only does it taste as I would expect it would if I cooked it through other means, there, there was just something special, an added factor that Mary just touched base on, which is this was cooked by the sun. And that's extraordinary. We are trained these days to go and turn on our gas burner or electric appliance and, and we're using energy in, in a way that we could say has helped contribute to the situation we're in with the global climate. Um, and there is another way to do that. So <laughs> I, I find that, that solar cooked food tastes, del it's delicious. Um, and I would challenge anybody to just to try to push the envelope of solar cooked food. For example, somebody told me they were challenged by the barbecue, you know, the smoked uh, flavor that you get by a long uh, barbecue over wood chips. <laughs> How can you get that with a solar cooker if you're not using smoke? Um, well, uh, the person who was telling me this told me that they took some wood chips and they placed the wood chips on the griddle of a parabolic cooker and that gave enough of the flavor off of the wood chips that then went into the food and it gave it that naturally smoky flavor. So that is something that we're, we're, we hear challenges sometimes that people who typically cook over charcoal or, or wood fire, they, they like that smoky flavor. Well, you can get that in solar cooked food too. <laughs> And I, I have a few favorites. Um, as I think I mentioned, I love to bake bread in the tube oven. And our local baker explained to me that because it was a tight space and there was a lot of steam within that tight space, that that's what creates the hard crusted bread. And the bread is amazing when you bake it in a, in a tube oven. And my husband is my taste tester. And um, I have gotten some very good reviews from him. Uh, from, you know, roasts and uh, uh, the chicken and stuffing and, you know, all, all kinds of meals. I think I've gotten uh, a couple of fives and then some 4.8s and, you know, but, but pretty good, pretty good ratings. <laughs> yeah, I'd, li I'd like to add to that, that one of my favorite experiences is when I'm training someone else how to solar cook, someone who's never seen it before from a different country and I intentionally say, okay, I want to cook food from your country so that you will know how well this works. And some of the best reactions that I've, I've seen have come from Kenyans who have tried solar cooked ugali for the first time, and they really didn't want to believe that it, it was even possible. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it, it did work. So that was, that was an exciting moment when you can demonstrate with foods from another culture. Jennifer, you've been very quiet. Would you like to, to add in about solar cooked food? <laughs> I'd love to. Thank you for asking, Alan. Um, being the newest solar cooker to the group, I think that it, you know, I ask myself regularly, why, I, why do I do this? And what prompted me to do it, obviously, was Mary and her history with solar cooking. But what keeps me doing it is the fact that I can cook anything that I want within one of the solar ovens that we own. Um, my favorite was the solar suitcase that I made early on, and I think that was proving to myself that I could do make a solar oven. And I think it is important that new solar cookers are really willing to experiment and be patient because it doesn't always come out perfectly the first time, but it's a lot better than some of my experiments within my conventional kitchen. <laughs> so when I cook outside in the sun, I, there is something about it that you're making a commitment to the environment and you're making a commitment to yourself because you're making a choice. You have a, a kitchen full of appliances and you can use any one of them to solar cook or to any one of them to cook, but only a solar oven will give you the, the satisfaction of cooking with the sun. So I'm very happy and pleased and thank Mary. And uh, you know, this was a great beginning to our journey but um, solar cooking is a really valuable tool, <laughs> excuse me, tool, and it's an educational tool that we've really come to, to enjoy sharing with others. Wonderful. 
And it seems that you've all answered Caitlin's question about what is your favorite thing to solar cook between uh, the, the lovely bread to local cuisines to anything that you can possibly think of. Cake. <laughs> yeah, lovely. <laughs> oh, hey, okay. So um, I had one slide or one um, video of cake that is vegan chocolate cake, which we entered into a, a contest for best dessert and we won the best dessert at a taste event. And every cake was, was baked in the um, homemade Copenhagen oven. So I baked for a long time. I, would, I baked, froze them, and then on the day of the event, we took the cakes out and uh, they were judged and we won a prize. So solar cooked food is, is good and vegan chocolate cake, you can find the recipe on our website, gdsnonprofit.org. Great. Thanks. And that is actually very close uh, to Elizabeth's question. Uh, and that vegan chocolate cake did look delicious. But Elizabeth wants to know if you can make cupcakes in the solar cooker. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Elizabeth, <laughs> you have four reflective panels and a dark uh, sheet, a muffin tin, you're in find a, you know, something to contain, retain that heat. Um, cupcakes come, come out great. Muffins, breakfast sandwiches, almost anything that, you know, that you can put in a small container. Um, you can, you don't need much of a reflective panel to make those cook in, I'd say about an hour. The larger ovens, maybe 20 minutes to 25 minutes. And there, that's more of that art of solar cooking that you were talking <laughs> about before, right? Uh, I, I would imagine that makes recipes hard to follow, but uh, it, it seems to me like when you gain the knowledge of, of how to really control what you're doing, uh, that, that just makes the results that much sweeter. Uh, we have a couple more questions left here. I haven't seen any new ones come in in a few moments. Uh, so once we get through these, if there are no other questions that come up, uh, we will go ahead and wrap, uh, but I promise we will answer any questions that do come up uh, in the next few minutes before we finish up. Uh, there's an anecdote here from uh, Celestino. Uh, they cook every day with the sun. Uh, that's possible. Uh, make the best rice with vegetables. Uh, and it was close to sunset, about 8 p.m. Uh, forgot to add water, and the water from the vegetables was enough to cook the rice. So... Uh, it sounds to me, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like uh, from that story, solar cooking can be a pretty forgiving process. Once you mm -hmm. know what you're doing, you can make a lot of things work. Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I would add to what Celestino mentioned without adding water, because there's already water in the vegetables and a lot of what you put in uh, into your cook pot the term waterless cooking is sometimes used is that you don't have to add water. You just put the vegetables in and, uh, or whatever you have that has water in it. It will, it will cook from the inside in a way. <laughs> water is, it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature. So actually with solar cooking, that is something that you would, would want to do is try to minimize the amount of water that you're using. So if you wanted to hard cook some eggs, you don't need to actually put them in a pot of boiling water. You do not have to use any water at all. The, the, you can just take the egg and put it into the solar oven, no water, and it will cook. <laughs> yes. Uh, so John has a, uh, a question. Uh, is there only one sweet spot for the heat? And to me, that sounds like the, the focus of like a parabolic reflector or maybe in the center of, an, uh, of a box oven. Or can you move uh, the cook pot to a different position to uh, have the difference between a boil and a simmer? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of room for for creativity and, and usage of these ovens. And, and solar cooks will develop uh, style that works well for them and indeed you can you can lift the pot of away from the the focus point and then that would reduce the uh, Intensity of the light that's at the bottom of the pot, 
But I would suggest that anybody trying to do that sort of thing, if you're using a reflector, is really to just be sure that you know what you're doing, that you've been properly trained, uh, because now you're, you're getting into the zone, you're putting your, your hands uh, into the uh, focused sunlight. So it, it, training, I should emphasize there, is, is you, you should know what you're doing. Um, you're handling hot cookware. So you know, these are not toys. These are, these are appliances. They're cooking appliances. Wear hot pad, uh, gloves, oven mitts, and, and that can be uh, very useful. Um, there are sweet spots for uh, ovens. If you think of the glass uh, face of a solar oven, if the glass is facing straight to the sun, I'll just, this is from this, a side view, this is sunlight coming in. Uh, it is most effective when this is coming in at a 90 degree angle. So uh, that, that can help optimize your, your input. And then um, another thing I wanna add is you do have to track like if your fruit's going to be out for a few hours, we know the sun moves. Well, the sun doesn't, but it appears to move in the sky. Um, so you, you do have to every so often go out and, and turn uh, the cooker so that you don't lose that, that direct sunlight coming uh, into the cooker and off of the reflectors and, uh, and into the cooker. And then one other thing I want to mention too that um, dealing with your reflectors, you, you do have to practice, as Alan said, you have to be safe with these. They're not toys. And um, you have to make sure that your reflectors are aligned to go into the oven and not like onto your patio furniture or uh, you know, you know, somewhere where you don't want errant rays concentrating. So they're really, they're not toys um, and you have to, do have to learn how to use them safely. Good note. I've, I learned that from experience. Did you melt some uh, or burn some furniture? A uh, little bit, a little bit of patio, you know, <laughs> just, just a little. <laughs> well, that sounds like it's just enough to be a cautionary tale. And not yes, it is. To be a, a <laughs> catastrophe. Well, melt, it, it was melted, not burned. It was mm. melted. And, and you don't want to melt yourself so uh, wearing a hat when you're out in the sun to turn your cooker, um, sunglasses, uh, good standard um, uh, practices. But I, I wanna add that you don't have to be out in the sun the whole time you're solar cooking. Some people think that that's what happens, but it, it's not necessarily the case. If you're going out and putting your food in the solar cooker, you're only out there for the amount of time to put the food in. Then you come inside, you can do other things. So it can be a great, time saver actually if you just let the food be out there cooking while you're doing other things and then um, you, you go out there to turn the cooker every now and then uh, come back inside even with parabolics something that I like to do is put up an umbrella and I stand under the, um, the sunbrella <laughs> umbrella and I stay in the shade while the, the, the parabolic is just outside because the parabolic is more of an active form of solar cooking. You, you do need to stay with it. You turn your food and it's a lot of fun. And they, <laughs> you, you get the, the sound and the smell all there um, as if you were cooking over a, over a, a range that, that's heated. Yeah, take, take the proper precautions and you'll be fine. Good notes. Uh, we do have a pair of questions here from Constance and I also have one of my own that I will ask, but we'll get to Constance's uh, questions first. Uh, first question, uh, I believe this one is uh, for Alan, is it's amazing you can make ugali in a solar cooker. Do you have any pictures to share? I do. I, I don't know if I have any dialed up in this presentation, but I certainly do have pictures. So Constance, if you could write to us at info at solarcookers.org, I would be happy to respond uh, and, sh and share a picture with you. So yeah, and I've tasted it. <laughs> I think I might even have some video to share, but we could start with some pictures, yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent, and the other question from Constance uh, is how receptive have various governments in developing nations been to solar cooking? I love that question because it opens up a can of worms that is policy decision making. And I guess my answer is it's hard to know. 
it's it's hard to know because you're talking to politicians, policymakers, and when you meet them at the United Nations, for instance, there's generally interest, and so um, you you might think, all right, it's it's gonna we got one, <laughs> we 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 have someone who's friendly to solar cooking, and um, you never really know what's going to happen when that policymaker that you've met and made a connection with, what's going to happen when they go home and they have to work with their committee and make decisions on, on what to do. So uh, the, there are some best approaches for keeping their interest. And one thing we do is we ask that people sign up for information, for more information from Solar Cookers International, so we can have their contact information and we can uh, build on a relationship. Um, reaching out to them specifically and asking them, uh, for instance, would you be willing to um, endorse something or uh, uh, help us in some way? <laughs> but maintaining a communication is, is important. So uh, that is a tricky question to answer. And then when I say you never, it's hard to know what's happening when they get home is that there, there's so much competition in the, the lawmaking process, the legislative process, um, that those individuals are, are trying to handle a lot, of, a lot of inputs. But I have to cite that there have been some fantastic uh, responses where we've had follow-up that has actually led to results. There was a delegate from Uganda who went home with the solar cooker after one meeting. Um, and also we have kept in touch with, with some of the policymakers who are actually making differences. So it will depend. And that's part of our job is to push solar cooking as, as, as much as we can with, uh, with these individuals so that we can really get it to stick. It's really helpful that solar cooking is what we call a cross-cutting solution, that it can have so many benefits across the board. It's, it's not just about cooking, but it's, it's a social benefit. It's an environmental benefit, a health benefit, and on and on, a financial benefit. And when you show all of this and you can um, sh present the evidence, then that's when they listen. <laughs> I hope, I hope that helps answer your question. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, my question that I wanted to throw out there, and then we'll get to uh, John's question here next, is uh, you know, here in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, uh, we have you know a pretty strong seasonal difference in the angle of the sun coming in. Uh, obviously, a lot less daylight, you know, available for cooking. But with that uh, angle of the sun in our winter months, does that have a big impact on the cooking, or is it just uh, shortening the window of cooking each day? Mary or Jennifer, would oh. you like to start um, with how that is in your area? Because you're yeah, in, you're, you're yeah, closer sure. To yeah, we're very uh, weather dependent. Um, when the sun, you know, my particular experience is um, it's more difficult for me to cook uh, now uh, because I have to find the sun. And, and it's not always just the angle of the sun, it's, it's what's blocking it. So, you know, I live in a neighborhood with houses that are fairly close together, lots of trees. So, uh, during the, the summer season, that sun is overhead, so I, it's unobstructed. Mm -hmm. um, as it starts to go lower, um, I'm chasing it. The last meal I was able to cook um, recently, I had to move the solar cooker three times. So I was literally chasing the sun around the front yard and the side yard and the neighbor's yard. And um, <laughs> so, so that can be an issue. We have good neighbors uh, for the most part. Um, so that, that could be an issue. And then I, I believe, and Alan can probably talk to this better, but the, as, as the sun is coming in at an angle, uh, it's, it's not as intense. So you do lose some of, some of that, um, I'll just call it intensity that, that you could count on for uh, getting your oven up to temperature, but it's possible. You, you still can cook in sunlight. Um, 
that is lower in the sky. And it's the same thing in the morning. Like, um, you know, if you can, you can put something on in the morning and you just angle your reflectors, you maybe increase the, the size of the, the area of the reflectors. So you're trying to get more sunlight in there. Um, so that's how I handle it uh, where I live. And that's what I was, oh, I'm sorry, Ellen. That's what I was going to say too, is that you have to change your reflectors. I think it's um, very possible. In my case, I, I move from the backyard to the front and cook near my driveway where it's more open. And it's important to gain more surface. I think um, we've invented different things. I, I have a, uh, a ad additional stick for the extender for my parabolic oven to make it lower than it traditionally comes. So, you know, you get creative, but if you want to cook and you have the uh, oven and the surface, in general, I haven't had any trouble cooking at this time of year and even beyond um, when you can get the, the oven face to the sun in the right direction and track it. So I don't have to jump through three yards, but I do have to move the location into my driveway. <laughs> I wanted to mention two more aspects to this. And in the winter time here in North America, where it gets cold, um, on cold days, there's actually typically less moisture in the air. And so even though the angles are lower, um, sufficient sunlight will get through and, and you, can, you can cook with that. Uh, you might think of when, when people who are out skiing and they're getting burned <laughs> by, by the sun. It, it's, it's because there can be very strong sunlight in the winter time. There's less moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, I love uh, picturing Mary moving her cooker. I, I do the same thing. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to point out that an extreme up to that is that on days when it's really, really cold outside, think frostbite warning time, um, and the sun is very low but maybe very strong, I might do my solar cooking indoors. And the way I do that, and others that I know have, are doing this too, is you go to a south-facing window where, again, the window is almost perpendicular to the incoming light, so the light will get through the window. And you put your solar cooker just on the inside of that south-facing window. Um, it's extraordinary, but you can solar cook indoors um, in, the, in North America in the wintertime. With, with tricks like that. Very neat. Yeah, I would have never would have never guessed you could do this indoors. And I, I would imagine a lot of our uh, audience here might not have had that idea either. So that's, that's hey, hey, Brad, Brad, <laughs> are you going to confess? <laughs> Jen no. Jennifer, Jennifer and I uh, cooked through the windows, you know, where the submarine is mm -hmm. at Carnegie <laughs> Science Center. We set the ovens up and we faced them toward the window and we cooked inside for one of our events when we had sun, so. You have great solar cooking for indoor features there. Yeah, down by the cafeteria, awesome. <laughs> oh, and there are a lot of great windows there to let yeah. that sunlight in. Uh, so, oh, fantastic. Uh, there was another anecdote here from Celestino, uh, currently uh, yesterday made a bunch of chutney and three carob cakes. Uh, and that the best way to store solar energy is by storing it in the food you cook. Oh, uh, I love that. I love it, Celestina. Uh, that food is a great storage vessel for solar energy. Uh, and I think the last question we have here is from John. Uh, and Celestina's <laughs> inside their car in Lisbon. Very uh, interesting. Uh, the question from John is, what about a solar rotisserie? You know, think about that mm. large, uh, you know, sem semi-circular tube of a rotisserie. Any, any way to do that? I yes. think John should work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. Well, the answer is yes. Um, if you think about the trough collectors that you might have seen in some of the pictures that we've shown today of the evacuated tube cookers, instead of having a tube there, you could have a, a spit that, that slowly turns. And I, while I haven't done that myself or tasted food done that, that, cooked that way myself yet, 
Um, I, I know that I know people who do that. Um, and then on the topic of uh, rotisserie, I just have to cite a fantastic example in Thailand um, where a gentleman who is just a little bit southwest of Bangkok has a large rig of mirrors and has a setup for gaiyang, which is a Thai rotisserie chicken. Um, and so you could look him up on YouTube. He's become quite a a his shop is quite a destination for a lot of um, people traveling from Bangkok down to the southern islands. <laughs> but indeed, yeah, and please make your own. <laughs> Follow Mary's advice on that. <laughs> All right. Wonderful, wonderful presentation tonight. Jennifer, Mary, Alan, thank you all very much for uh, giving your time for us this evening to learn about this. Uh, very interesting topic. I think we had a lot of great questions. We had nearly 20 questions come through the, the Q&A box here. So uh, wonderful uh, that you have all this great experience. Uh, so thank you again uh, for everyone who tuned in. And thank you again to uh, PPG and Cook Myosite for supporting Cafe Sci here with us at Carnegie Science Center. We will be back uh, next month, December 7th, with our next presenter. And the topic will be Innovation Strategy for the Polymers Industry with uh, Raj Krishnaswamy. So make sure you tune in for that one, and we will have more Cafe Sci coming to you in the new year. Uh, Thank you all again for being here and have a wonderful night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.